Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the San Francisco Playhouse. I wait for that roar of applause that would come from the two or 300 people sitting out in the house. And yet here we are, we've been relegated to television. We're doing two television shows a week. I never was interested in television, but here we are. And I think we don't, we so, we don't so much have a, have a full house, but we have, we have houses full of people who are trying to stay connected, who are trying to keep going. And it's really great to be able to bring you these wonderful fireside chats with great playwrights. I'd like to thank, take just a moment to thank the Ohlone people who lived on this land here in San Francisco Bay Area and, and, and stewarded it so beautifully over so many hundreds of years, caring for it and loving it and nurturing it. And, and we just would like to express our gratitude to them for being here and looking after this land before, before we came. Um, so we've had a lot of great playwrights, playwrights from all over the country and all over the world uh, here. And uh, one of the playwrights that I admire the most, who I think has, has, has written some of the, the greatest comedies, I think comedy is so much harder to write uh, than anyone else. And, and also who has won uh, some Tony Awards and uh, awards in London and awards in every city and had thousands of productions of his plays done. I'd like to welcome Ken Ludwig. How are you doing? Am I on? I'm good. I'm you good. are, yes. I'm you good. see, you, you didn't have to walk in from the wings. You just, you just we materialized you like Star Trek. You know? Oh, great. Oh, great. Thanks for having me. I just love being here. I love. So cool. I love your room. Tell us a little bit about the room. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, it's it's uh, it's just where I work. So what I do is I put up a, a little table there and I put my computer on it. But I write longhand, so I sit in chairs like this. Usually there's an ottoman right in front of me, actually, uh, and uh, and I just sit and, and it gives me inspiration because it's there's books all it's just filled 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 with books and windows, and that's about it and pictures and sculpture. You've got some pretty beautiful art there. Fire. Thank you. And the windows look out on. Those look out on a uh, a, a backyard, uh, and those look out. Uh, there's opposite. There's another one's just like it that look out on a deck, and and uh, so so it's just trees all around and lots of light. And there's there's uh, 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 you know lights in the ceiling or, or uh, windows in the ceiling, and, and yeah, it's comfy. It's great. I and just close the door, and I just can forget about everything but writing. And you're in Washington D.C. in the center of the great national circus. Oh boy, we got a circus here. I don't know. I get you know I'm on I'm I'm on the screen and I can't say anything, but it's a circus. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say anything profane, but actually we can because we aren't on that. We aren't on network television. You know, we're on the private San Francisco Playhouse <laughs> Network. So, good, good. Well, if you feel like cussing, just go right ahead. Just go right ahead and cuss. I know you mentioned that you that you work uh, in longhand, and I, I know I got I, I I do journaling and I write a blog, you know, a monthly blog for art theater. And somebody told me a couple of years ago that I that it would be good for me to start writing and just longhand, and I and I did it, and I and I thought it was just it had it had a, a huge effect on me, and I can't even really nice. quite explain the effect. But you could, I'll bet. Tell me, tell me why you you don't work, why you write your plays in longhand. Well, I have very strong feelings about it. I think people write better in longhand, uh, I, I, and why? Well, I think I think there is truly a, a sort of tactile uh, um, uh, um, relationship between it's in your body. Uh, uh, there's some practical reasons too, but but first of all, it's it's that sense that you that you're really in connection with the work, and it's on a pad, and you can see it all at one time. In a practical sense, I I got this advice a long time ago from Neil Simon of all people to say, <laughs> use a pad that is has thin is thinly lined and is a long legal pad because then you can actually sort of outline your whole play on one page and you can sort of see it and it's really true you know i can get so much on one page so i can i can see this 
I, my work tends to be very architectural, so I can see the shape of the whole thing all at once, and, and I'm in touch with it. And and it it it's um and then I'll type it then I'll type it up into it, it could be I'll type the after I've written a whole first draft I think it's pretty okay and then I'll type it into the computer and then I'm stuck uh, editing it on the computer but I uh, but then then what I do is I print it out and print it out in between and I always make all the changes in longhand again which I think is just the you know everybody has their own way of doing things but that's just right for me I think that is so wonderful. Um, I like the way you said, I'm in touch with it, because mm -hmm. you are literally touching it. That's, just, that's, just a, that's a good phrase, and you took your hands and you went, I'm in touch with it. You're, your words are right there in your hands. Yeah. And I yeah. like those long legal pads, too. I like them because I can have little sections, a little section up here, a section here, and a section here, and yeah. then I can see the shape of, shape of it. So I totally get that. So thanks. That's the first tip to the to the budding young young writers of America, right? As a playwright, I'm sure it's true for novels too, but as a playwright, I get to sketch the set in a sense and see where things are and I can go, oh no, I can move from so so being able to sketch sketch the the the, the art some of the artistic pieces of it is really nice too. Yeah. Well, you said you said uh, the architecture of it, and that's interesting because you you're interested in the room in which it takes place. Mm -hmm. If you if you were sketching it, right? I think I don't think very. I think that's a little unusual for playwrights to be uh, tactile in that way. Of you probably where's the front door, and there's some steps down to a living room, and then you go over, and there's another door, and absolutely, you feel, absolutely. I, I, yeah. I, you know, just where I am. Now, some of the plays, uh, uh, a play called Baskerville I wrote, which is uh, five actors and uh, uh, two of them play uh, Holmes and Watson from Hamlet Baskervilles and three of them uh, uh, play 40 other parts. So it's <laughs> not a room. It's not that they're, you know, it, it, it's not a living room play at all. It's changing places all the time. But still knowing a sense of how I can change them and then think, well, this person's off stage and needs time to change, and this actor or actress, and and therefore, where are they and what's going on makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I'm a, what I'm sort of a, one of my mos is that I'm a set designer, oh, and so nice. I direct and design, nice. and uh, and I so I also have a great I have appreciation for architecture, and I. I love reading. You don't see too much of this anymore, but a lot of like Neil Simon did this. The whole first page was a description mm -hmm. of the room and the set and what was where and what it was. And he thought that stuff, he thought that stuff all the way through. And, and I know you, you do too. Have you had set designers? Have you uh, enjoyed working with the various set designers on shows? I've loved it. I've been so lucky. In my set designers uh, uh, from the get-go, for uh, Robin Wagner for Crazy for You, and and uh, Fable Ford has done about the last five of my sets, and, and uh, he gets Tony Award after Tony Award because he's so yes. real. It's one of and my favorites. So much to the table, you know. They think it through, and for the last show I had, the one you mentioned at Arena, uh, is. Uh, it's in an abstract, it just takes two desks or it can be much more filled out because again, it goes from place to place. And he just thought of a way of, of a background that evoked the whole piece that was just brilliant. And it, and it, it elevated everything and brought so much to it. So yeah. Now, is that a Beowulf Boritz set? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. One, it, one of my, one of the set designers I, I admire the most. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just kind of did it because I had no choice, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to, put up a play and I had no money and I had some friends and we would rent some little storefront, you know, somewhere. And, and I had, I had, didn't, I didn't, I hadn't cut off any, I didn't cut off any of my fingers in freshman shop. <laughs> and so they made, they, they gave me a job after school building the set. So I spent like six or seven years counting grad school, like building sets. So, I knew how to draft and I knew how things were put together. So I just started doing it just because I like somebody had to do it. You know, I didn't ever, I didn't ever really study it in school, but I also think that it's interesting that you mentioned architecture and the architecture of the play because of, 
you know, we you think play right would be spelt like W R I T E, right? You know, but it's not. It's W R I G H T, which is more along the lights of a of a boat right or a cart right or a yeah somebody who builds something right out of absolutely you build it and i love that about playwriting you know you're you're that's why in a sense again the pencil and paper you know you're you're shaping you're putting something into a shape and and that shape has traditionally you know been a a, in a sense a three-act structure regardless of whether it's called five acts in shakespeare or a one-act play now it's always in in a three-act shape because uh, 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 most good plays and uh-huh. and there, there's a, a terrific book um by gibson the guy who wrote um uh, uh two for the seesaw and miracle worker william gibson, mm-hmm. it william gibson? yeah i think it's william um uh called shakespeare's game when he oh. spent a year at harvard teaching shakespeare he taught he his view was, which is so great, is, you know, you can't teach inspiration. You can't teach playwriting by saying, here's how you come up with new ideas. But here's what Shakespeare's plays, here's how he wrote plays. Here's oh, wow. Exactly what he write wrote. that down. Yeah, it's, it's out of print. It's a wonderful book. Uh, and it's all about Shakespeare's architecture and how he looked at it. If you look, Hamlet just is, is so amazingly solid. You know, in that first act, you know, you start with a ghost, you know, he emphasizes the fact that it's pretty good to start plays with an exciting moment because you get to <laughs> his attention. You do. You know, Romeo and Juliet starts with a street brawl. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And there's a reason that you start with a ghost in the first scene in Hamlet. You know, and then you get to meet Sh- uh, Hamlet and why he's so melancholy and his problem with his, you know, uncle and his uh, mother. And then and then Horatio comes in and come back. So then you're still in the first act and those last two scenes, the first act are on the parapets and Hamlet meets the ghost. Well, you know, if you, if you don't have the audience's attention by that time, you never will. So it's just it, seeing how he did that is, is remarkable. And that really is a kind of architecture. Yeah. So I'm sure every play is different and every inspiration is a little different, but you know, if there's going to be architecture, then there has to be a foundation of some kind. Mm-hmm. So what is the, what kind of things form the foundation for a play with you? Or is that a dumb question? What is, what, what is the, you know, the little, what lights the idea? Well, what often lights the idea, it's varied a little over the years because I've ended up running sort of three different kinds of plays. I started out wanting to be in the theater more than anything in the world when I was 10 years old. And, and I, I wrote one, one sort of mock tragedy about Abelard and Eloise, and that was enough. I got that out of my system. It got done. It got done in New York, but it was not, it's not what I do. And then I started writing comedies, and I realized that I, I'm basically an optimistic kind of guy, and and uh, the, and the 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 joy, the 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 um, sort of deep, rich joy that you get out of as you know the three high comedies, as you like it, Twelfth Night and Much Ado, and of course Midsummer. You know that's what I and I grew up admiring most, and wanting to imitate somehow eke out in a little tiny way a sense of that kind of joy. So I, I would think of either about historical subjects. One play I started writing was about uh, the Shakespeare Jubilee, actually. All, uh, the subject was Shakespeare uh, of uh, 1769 when David Garrick put Shakespeare on the map. And then I came up with it. That ultimately morphed into a play uh, because David Garrick was could only be seen in an engraving, when he got to Little Stratford, people didn't wouldn't recognize him. So it ended up his brother came, and they thought he was Garrick. Well, that morphed into a play called Lend Me a Tenor, ultimately about a a a a, a star who comes uh, to a little town and. <laughs> gets involved in the light in a theater in a little town. So a lot of my plays have had had the world of theater at the base, Moon Over Buffalo and and the games of foot and and uh, 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 crazy for you. Crazy and for you, Buffalo certainly. And they, yeah. they, 
they're, they're all about the theater because I think because I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, I, I, I really um, thought uh, uh, my uh, life was thinking about the theater. I wanted to be in the theater, but there was a little town that had one very nice community theater, but that was it. And so to me, it, to me, the theater represented the world and that was a world I wanted to enter. So, so play after play in the first surge of maybe 10 plays uh, were all centered back either backstage or, or, or um, uh, in, in the planning stages or about opera or uh, um, somewhere about the theater. And then about, about um, after I had a few plays on Broadway and, 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 uh, and uh, in London and stuff, I, I was asked by a theater, um, actually the Alley Theater in Houston, if I would do an adaptation of Treasure Island for them. Because they wanted something, for a real family show. I'd had a couple shows there already. I directed a, a big show at, at the Alley in, at, at Cleveland Playhouse. It was a dual opening. And um, so I ended up writing an adaptation in verse of... Uh, of Treasure Island, and I loved it, and the audiences really loved it. And uh, uh, and then some, uh, the Bristol Old Vic in, in England said, "Oh, you did that? Would you do one for us?" So I ended up doing the Three Musketeers for them. And then Barry Edelstein at the Old Globe called me uh, about five years ago and said, "Hey, we need something for our summer season that would be fun and lively in our, you know, big big uh, theaters." Uh, would you, what do you want to do? And I thought, well, I've always loved the Robin Hood legend. Maybe I'll do a sort of comedy drama about the Robin Hood legend because there's no urtext, there's no source other than uh, the old ballads. So, so I did something called Sherwood. <clears throat> so that's become sort of a cottage industry for me. I, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've written about four or five adaptations of classics along the way, and I've and I've loved doing that. Well, and the the Sherlock Holmes too. Right? Yeah, well, that's right. The bas they're right, exactly. Yeah, I think it's so fascinating that a story reading about David Garrick and how his brother was mistaken for him when he showed up somewhere to do a play in England, and that 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 was an account you read. Was that was that Samuel Pepys or somebody like that, right? There are there are a lot of wonderful chronicles of of this Shakespeare Jubilee. Boswell went to it, and uh, um, uh, and Garrick. There's a whole liter huge literature on Garrick. I have his collected letters spread right over there. Uh, he was the most interesting guy. He was the he was clearly the most successful uh, person of the theater in all of the 18th century, and he ran Drury, I mean, you know, Drury Lane for 30 years, and. And he and himself is so interesting. So it, it's a great peep into the theater. But, but, but that, that idea, and I'll come back to David Garrick in a minute, but that idea, that that idea turned into Lend Me a Tenor is a wonderful story. Isn't that funny? Because, because it, 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 to me, it's, it, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect example of how a, a, a writer will, will you creep into something and you follow your nose and that that, yeah. that little account of Garrick being mis Garrick's brother being mistaken for him that that could become the Mia tenor is a spectacular story I love it it's a window yeah, yeah. well I think I think you should do the Derek David David Garrick play I don't know whether it would be a, a funny play though was he was he a funny guy well, I actually have written it, and it's called Shakespeare's Jubilee. I finished oh, it cool. a year ago. I, I now have four plays, you know, because of the pandemic. I had two openings set up for this period so far, and so uh, that's one of them. And, and uh, I sent it to a friend who liked it a lot and says he's, he was an artistic director, says he's going to do it. And um, so that's in the works. Uh, and I did end up, you know, what is it, like 20 five years later going back and writing what i call i refer to in my notes as the garrick play <laughs> oh and there and and, and when when we do productions again there'll be one somewhere who's going to do it yeah well i, I can't say because they'd kill me you know they all everybody wants to save in the now i did that once oh. and made a mistake and i said oh so and so is going to do it and i got the theater called me and said you know that's our that's our press release that's our announcement you can't take that from us so i can't say <laughs> okay, it's a secret then. We'll have to let everybody stay tuned. We're going to find out. 
at yeah. some point, what theater is going to do Shakespeare's Jubilee? My favorite thing about David Garrick was what he did with Shylock. Mm. Because up until that time, Shakespeare like wrote it to appease and to appeal in a way to the anti-Semitism in Elizabethan London. Yeah. And and but he the, what I like to say is he just couldn't help himself. Right. right. He, he hid the kernel of a real person in there, a real human being with real feelings and heart and soul to be discovered later by someone. You know, well, you know, you can't 150 really years, 200 years later, David Garrick discovered that soul. Right. And right. it revolutionized theater to think that this stock villain could right. be played with such heart and right. soul. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And, you know, Garrick was it was such an interesting guy because, you know, he wrote an alternative ending to King Lear. Uh, he wrote an extra scene into Romeo and Juliet to sort of, sort of <laughs> and they could both be awake in the tomb at the same time and have a love. <laughs> you know, he was not above changing lots of stuff in Shakespeare because it wasn't considered sacrosanct. When when he yeah, yeah. 1760s, when he started doing it a lot in in London, he, he, you know Shakespeare was not considered the untouchable greatest genius that ever was. Garrick sort of rediscovered that. And right. then fix them up a little bit. That's so funny. Do you, do you know? Is it is, is <laughs> does, it, does it exist? Oh yeah. Does it exist this the, the scene in Romeo and Juliet with the, the two kids at the tomb and yeah, I got and it right over there. Absolutely. And the alternate ending for Lear, the happy ending of Lear. The ending. Cordelia is alive. She comes. <laughs> she marries. You know. Uh, um, uh, well, who's not? Uh, um, not Edmund. Uh, Ed, Ed, no, I always get the two confused as to which is the villain of the two uh, stepbrother and brother. So it's I Ed, know, me too. Ed, brother, right? Or is Edgar, it Edgar and Edmund. Edgar, Edmund, Edmund, is, Edmund is the bastard. Edmund is the bastard. She marries Edgar. <laughs> and I think, and, and, and they're all very happy. It was based on a, a, an earlier happy ending uh, by um, oh, uh, uh, Thomas um, that had been written about 30 or 40 years before. Uh, Otway, no. But one of one of the uh, Nam Tate, Nam Tate, N A H U M. This is first. Uh -huh. Tate wrote wrote an alternate ending like that, and Garrick took it over and changed it and made it better. And Garrick played at, at the Drury Lane that version of King Lear is in all thirty years and never changed it. Is that amazing? We would we would we would tend to get all huffy about that today, right? That would be considered a, a faux pas of sorts to take the great bard and change him or to write a tragic ending for lend me a tenor and just put it on <laughs> that's a good idea where gonna... everyone everyone dies right people right. are being slashed and murdered right and left blood flows Ludwig dies believe and me. we go no why did he have to die i'll, I'll take that under advisement <laughs> okay, we'll, well, we'll commission it. The adaptation, right? Good, you got it done. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, yeah, you know, my wife and I went to London one time and we saw a musical version of Lend Me a Tenor. That's right. And, and we really enjoyed it. Yeah, I thought and it was did, too. Now, did you do the book for that? I did not. The, the two guys who did the book, the uh, uh, music and lyrics, wanted me to do the book. Uh, and I just, I was so overwhelmed at the time with commissions and with other things I had to do. I said, you know, be well and do it. And they did it and they did a good job. And did you, did you think, did you, did you approve of their work? Did you feel like yeah. they, had, they had done a good job? I well, absolutely so. You know, we're theater people. We've been, I've been in the theater. We've both been in the theater for, four, for 40 years and we went to see it and we thought it was quite good. Yeah. And then the London critics just hated it. I know it. I know it. That's they the just go ahead. That's just the trouble about ta put taking things into the commercial theater. I have a, a play right now that's. Uh, uh, I have tomorrow. I have a casting um, um, meeting, uh, uh, and it's for New York and it's for Broadway and it's a new play. And you know, part of me swallows and goes, "I don't know. I don't know." 
you know, it, it, it's the it's the way everybody wants to do things. If you're a playwright, you want to get your play on Broadway, but it just is exposing yourself to potentially negative reviews that everybody then remembers. Right, and, and then it's dead, right? I mean, dead and, and goes on, but usually it's dead after that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, it may be that that the pandemic is going to change things in regards to the future of Broadway and the way in which plays it might end up. I wonder if it might end up being a little healthier situation where, you know, we would develop a play at San Francisco Playhouse for a while and work mm -hmm. on it and might get some reviews and then it would move to another regional theater and end up on Broadway. Right. You know, I think that's kind of a, it's a healthier thing. I'm, I've made made my world has ended up being so much in the regional theaters of America, and then throughout the world. There's this whole right. you know, number in in, in America is hundreds and uh, 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 400, 500 regional theaters now. And then of course there's a big amateur market of high schools and colleges and things like that. And and Europe, it's it's if all of Europe, not just any England doesn't have that itself, but but all of Europe and then stuff gets translated and it gets done. That, that's, that's, the world, that's the world of theater. When people ask me what is, you know, England has a national theater and it sits on the South Bank uh, and, and it's a beautiful building that's got three spaces and, and, and there you go, that's the, that's the national theater of England. What's the national theater of the United States? Well, our national theater is, is, is our, our uh, uh, joyous, uh, um, uh, for 500 regional theaters around the country that themselves, you know, be, are the, our national theater. Right. And it's much right. healthier, much better. Yeah. Well, it's just very democratic. Yeah. It's very, very American that we're spread out all over the place. Yeah. So a couple, of, let me ask you a couple of questions. Let's start. I think, I think that people are mystified by by comedy and what makes a play funny. And it's, I think it's harder. I think comedy is harder. If you think about how many great farces have been written, you know, since the 19th century, I mean, there, you could count them on the fingers of one hand. Yeah. I mean, there was Moliere and then there was Ben Johnson and there was the restoration era you know, Goldsmith, Sheridan, and then... Oh, you're right. Yep. Nothing, right? And then, you know, and today we have, we have you. And <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And no, and, and Neil Simon was a great writer of comedies. Uh, you know, I think of a, I'm having a senior moment and can't remember it, but the great British comedy about the the play that they turn the stage around and you watch it from the back. Noises off. Noises off. off. Noises right. off. So, so these plays, these great comedies, and maybe we'll even we'll even let art be part of that. You know, Good. Good. although art gets pretty rough. It's not always. It's not altogether a funny play. But um, God, what what is the secret? You are the master of, of comedy. What do you think? What do you say? What do you say to young people who? Would like to write comedy but are afraid to or well you you really you're amazing i'm so impressed because you know i spend my life thinking of nothing with comedy you got to think of everything and sets and you boy are you on the button it, you're so right well, what i say look there's a great tradition uh, in comedy but as you say it is very sparse look there were there was nothing before shakespeare if you don't count the greeks you know plautus wrote some nice stuff and some some invented some great tropes about you know uh, uh, fathers and sons arguing and and uh, old man young wife and stuff. But basically, up up through then you get into England and there's nothing there before before uh, uh, Shakespeare. You had things like Gammer Girton's Needle, <laughs> Ralph Royster Doyster. Those were the big comedy, you know, or the only comedies uh, written. And then Shakespeare comes along and invent as you know, Bloom says, invents the human. So he, and, and writes 10 comedies. 
and uh, four of which are such beyond masterpieces. But then what happens? As you said, nothing happens till the restoration and you've got Congreve, uh, but they're still not robust, beautiful. They really only, next robust, beautiful play is like 17, uh, what is it, 1707 with uh, the Bow stratagem and the recruiting officer. She George stoops Lawrence. to conquer. You know. Then you get, no, 17, that's another 100 years. Then you wait another 60 years to 1775 with She Stoops, which I think is the greatest comedy after Shakespeare, and Sheridan, and right. one for by John O'Keefe, Wild Oats, which is a sort of masterpiece. And then, as you say, things go completely quiet in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, comedy world. You have one good comedy, London Assurance, by a guy named Dion Bucci Cohen, around you know, uh, you know, eighteen uh, thirties, uh, uh, and then and then you got to wait until you know, till till for um, uh, um, um, uh, um, what's his name, uh, uh, Sir Arthur Wing Panera. He kicks it off. Uh, uh, right in that, you know, just pre-1900 period, really popular, first playwright to be uh, knighted, and uh, um, and he writes The Magistrate, some ter terrific farces, really ter The Schoolmistress, uh, and then you get into Oscar Wilde, and then you get into Noel Coward, and uh, then things go quiet again. It's such an, int and, and so when I teach, talk to kids, especially about what to do, the answer is read those, get to know those, because those plays that we, I just mentioned in, in, in one breath are the masterpieces of comedy in the English language. Right. And that's about it. That's about it. Yeah, Kaufman and Hart. Kaufman and Hart, once you get, yes, I agree. Two great plays, yep. Then all the way up to Mr. Simon almost, you know. Absolutely. Not a lot of great, it, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough art, yeah. It's like, what, it, it, and, and, and nobody can really quite explain what makes something funny either. <laughs> it, it, I agree, you know, you just sort of, you know, read, if you have a set, you know, you need a sense of humor, but you need, obviously all these plays that we just talked about, ring a ring a depth to them too you know they, they're they're about the human condition but viewed from a just a slightly optimistic sense you know you you, you always know you know you know uh, louis cronenberg says uh, uh, he was a teacher and a scholar in the 1950s maybe um and a critic he, he said that um uh, we all think of comedies of uh, the issue is having a happy ending that you know the boy getting the girl and the, and the, right. the girl and the girl you know and the boy getting boy uh um it, the romance uh, uh con consummated uh and he said that that um you know great comedies are not just a matter of happy endings they're a matter of creating an environment where happy endings are inevitable and that's really just right you know, you, you create, every time you write a play that's a comedy, you create a world that has, a, in, in a sense, an inner optimism, an inner joy, an inner buoyancy, regardless of the travails that happen to, to the characters uh, through the plot um, uh, or through their inner, through their souls and what they do to themselves. But they're still, things are still going to end in a way that gives you a sense of, of confidence. Uh, I'm thinking particularly like J.B. Priestley's When We Are Married. Oh, my God, it's a great play. Um, uh, uh, it's, about, it's about three couples uh, who, uh, he wrote it in the th probably 30s or, 40s or 40s, but it was, it's set earlier, set about 20, 30 years earlier, when marriage was a very sacrosanct institution. And three couples are celebrating their silver wedding anniversary, and they find out they were not legally married. The right. part he didn't have his credentials, so they they're they're it causes all sorts of havoc for them and for the village they live in and for the mayor. That's a wonderful premise for a comedy. It wouldn't work today because nobody would care about that. But but it has an inner heartbeat to it. a heartbeat as well as you know is being really funny, right? real joy. Right. Well, I think I think a lot of comedy also as a you know, the element of satire and the element of skewering the the, the personalities of, of, of humans too, 
kind of pointing out our fo foibles in That's a way which like Moliere was the master of that kind of comedy, comedy which was basically uh, satirical and- um, Absolutely right. And you mentioned, you, mentioned ben, uh, uh, you mentioned Johnson. I mean, The Alchemist is that way, uh, very much so. Very or, satirical. Savagely yeah. satirical, but very funny. One more question, and then I guess it's a little later in D.C. than it is here, and you probably probably be getting ready for nighty night time. But um, so I, I I I like to describe playwrights as the prophets of our time because you know I think I think playwrights have these more, more sensitive antenna than the rest of us, and they you're able to pull down news from the multitude of information circling around us and turn it into a a, a vision of, of something that helps us see ourselves so we can actually see who we are. And so I wonder, um, as far as prophecy goes, we're in a, the world's in a hell of a pickle right now. And, uh, and we don't know how we're going to come out of it. We don't know what the future is going to be or the future of theater. Um, what do you think, what do you think is going to be different? But how is theater going to change? You know, that is the great question and the $64,000 question. And I'm not sure. I think, I think first of all, I think we are going to come out of it the way we came out of uh, uh, World War I into a roaring 20s. I think once we get our confidence back, we're going to um, we, we're, we want to regain our optimism. And I think we'll get through this pandemic. That's clear, and that's what's killing us right now. But so is the so is the political situation. But that'll change too. Uh, and, and I I think to some extent we're going to get back to you know functioning as human beings in a in a, a, a an intelligent society, and that'll be fine. But we're never going to be able. I've been thinking about this because I've been writing like crazy during this time, uh, and I'm just working on a new play right now, set during World War II, which which I think is. The last play I did, ironically enough, was set in World War II. Maybe that's why I was thinking about it. But that was a two-hander. This is a, a robust comedy, uh, but but it's also dangerous because you know in London in, uh, in in 1939, well 40 especially when the Blitz came, you know it was a so deeply dangerous place. You just didn't know what house was going to blow up next to you. You know the the Nazis bombed. Uh, London for 57 consecutive nights starting in September 1940. You know, and, and, and yet they held on, thanks a lot to Churchill, uh, um, um, uh, it, it, somehow finding an inner reserve and getting through it and then rebuilding their society despite, you know, flattening Coventry. Uh, 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 and, and I think that's the closest um, metaphor that I can see in a, in, in a, in a literary way uh, right now. And I, and I think finding metaphors like that, I think uh, facing them right off, there's probably a, there's probably a mistaken identity comedy to be written about people wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'm the guy to write it, but that is a little, you know, it's, 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 it's scary, but. Mask, the masks drama returns. Yes. The masked man, you know, the return of the masked man. <laughs> Lone Ranger play. But, well, that's uh, fascinating. And thank you. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure that the people who've seen your plays at, at the theaters around the Bay Area will really enjoy getting to meet you and hearing some of the things that made you a playwright and some of the ways in which you work. And I really very much, very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you so Thanks much for joining us. Really yes. And thank all of you at home for uh, tuning in to uh, the Fireside Chat with Ken Ludwig. Wonderful conversation. I wanted to let you know that this coming Monday on our Zoomlet series, we're going to return to one of our favorite playwrights, Dipika Guha, and a play called An American Dream. Uh, these are the director-driven 15-minute plays that we do every Monday night. And uh, the director is going to be the legendary Tom Ross, former artistic director of the Aurora Theatre Company. And also, we've got an, we, we extended our production of art, so there's an entire another week and a half to, to check out the live stream, or not the live stream, but the, 
on-demand stream of art. And I think you all will really enjoy it. Thank you once again. And uh, good night from the San Francisco Playhouse. Good night. Thank you so much for having me.